Let's stand as we read just a couple of verses from Jonah 4. Today I'd like to talk to you about an angry prophet and a merciful God. And we're going to look at the last two verses of Jonah 4. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And what a weird ending. Look at that. And also much cattle. <laughs> What's that? Lord, bless your word. Give us insight, motivation, and purpose and drive for living. And I pray the same questions that you confront us with in this text. They'll be the questions that we leave this room with and that we will have the spiritual moxie to say, where am I with this chapter and with what God is doing in my life? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Take a seat. Well, of course, Jesus came into Jerusalem to the praise of the crowds. You know this. It's Palm Sunday, and we celebrate the fact that Jesus, I was thinking this morning of how he had spiritual moxie, didn't he? Going into a scenario where he knew he was going to die, and uh, he was going to be beaten and rejected and mocked and just done wrong. And yet he went into Jerusalem knowing these things, and the people were waving the palm branches. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet within one week, the crowd, we don't know that it was the exact crowd, but the crowd also said, crucify him. Isn't it funny how the heart can change in a week? Uh, we celebrate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ here at our church. We want you to know this morning that you can know God personally. You can have a relationship with him every day of your life. Uh, the problem is that we are sinful, we're, we're born sinners, and we have a sinful nature. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Everybody's going to die. I've been thinking about that lately and thought, you know, I only have, I don't know, it's, I'm 49. Oh, I love being able to say that because in October it'll be 50, 50. And I'll tell you something, man, once you start going toward 50, I got this weird feeling that I'm like, ooh, this is not good. I mean, then you got 60 and 65 and then maybe on up into glory. Now, I know some of you are going, you're just a whippersnapper. I'm 85 years old. I'm 91. We, time is crucial, guys. It's crucial. It's like Christmas time. We love being together. You know, we should love being together and zero in on God's purpose and, and look at things and go, this, this is... This is uh, God's purpose. I don't want to waste my time uh, with certain things. Jesus came and died, and the Bible says that we can have that spiritual nature. We can have it corrected and conquered by what Jesus did on the cross. He died for our sins, was buried, and three days later, he rose again from the dead. And when we turn from our sins and recognize our, and acknowledge that we need God, and we say, by faith, I believe that what Jesus did. I believe he died on a cross 2,000 years ago. No, of course I wasn't there, but I believe it. There's something inside of me that says, I ought to believe that. When you make that decision, God erases your slate, and he comes into your life, and gives you the ability to not only live above sin, but when we do sin as believers, we recognize it and know how to get beyond it. We just know what to do when you have Jesus. And if you have never received Christ, what a great day today, Palm Sunday, a celebration Sunday where you can come to know the Lord and experience renewal, refreshing revival in your life. Let me ask you, are you on fire for God. If you don't have much time left, Nineveh had 40 days. Well, of course you know, God showed mercy to Nineveh. 
You know the story. Uh, you know, I wanted to do a first, I, I wish I could go back, I would do a first person narrative of Jonah. What a great sermon that would be. Uh, but Jonah, God called him, said, I want you to go to Nineveh, proclaim uh, the forgiveness of sins, basically. Their sin has come up before me. God did not want to judge Nineveh at that time. And so he said, Jonah, you go. Jonah said, no, I'm not going. I'm going to run. I get a, he gets on a boat, tries to run from God. You can't run from God. So God starts seeking him out through the sailors. And next thing you know, they throw him overboard. He's in what? A fish belly. Hello, that's wrong. And so he, he has a new uh, fragrance when he's spit up on the ground and, and he's back up on the beach. And God gives him a second chance. He goes to Nineveh, proclaims, uh, yet in 40 days, God is going to show up here. And the people of Nineveh begin to respond with renewal and revival, with fasting, praying, turning from sin. And they just say, this is important. What a weird revival. It came to an unlikely place, Nineveh. Hello. Who, none of us would have put, uh, uh, well, we don't bet, but we, we, we would have not cast lots uh, on the fact that Nineveh would have seen revival. None of us would have said that. We probably would have been like Jonah. No way. Are you kidding? We would have said that. But God always has a way of going beyond our abilities, and he brought renewal and revival to Nineveh. And what was our prophet's response? Look at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, this, this is our prophet, our reluctant prophet. Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What an attitude, right? One year ago from right now, we had life action that had just been to our church. It was one of the best revivals I've ever experienced in my life. We brought in a team of, I hate to call them professionals, but they were professional. They were excellent. We spent 30 days, y'all remember that? We spent 30 days in prayer, in prayer groups, asking God to show up and move. It's amazing, though, how revival can come. And what happens after a revival? I'm not talking about an evangelistic revival, although that's, we're not throwing that out. But this is a revival of God's people. And what happens after revival? A valley. And what happens after a revival? We kind of revert back to our ways. Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you reverted to the real you? You're just not where God wants you. This chapter, I'm going to tell you, I've been telling a few of you this week, this chapter, it haunts me. Because when I ask myself, what displeases me when God shows grace? And, 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 and it displeased him to the point of anger. So displeasure, or get, you know what I'm saying here. Uh, anyone who's married knows this. We get upset about something and then what happens we start to yammer and yipper and 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 go back and forth and then boom it's a huge fire now it's no longer a small little match the thing is roaring and blazing and i am mad right y'all don't hear me but i'll just speak for myself then <laughs> hear me what makes you mad when god shows grace when God shows grace to Nineveh, that place where you say, man, God shouldn't show grace there. He shouldn't show it. The person doesn't deserve it. It's not right, God. The Ninevites, this person for us, that person that you work with, and you're angry. You're just angry. You're upset, and it turns to anger because God shows up. I remember a time when we had a revival in a small group at my house in Arlington. I, I, I told you this story the first Sunday I was here, that uh, we, we had an incredible revival in a small group. We started a small group with very few people, and next thing you know, we've got like 32 uh, young adults coming over to our house, taking up my whole street uh, because it was a small street with no sidewalks. And so one night, this guy comes over, and he's, uh, he's a little bit sauced up on 
the good stuff, I guess. And, and uh, uh, okay, it's not good stuff. Please don't write me a note going to pastor said it was good. Whatever. You know what I mean. Um, you know, this guy comes to the door and he's like, I answer the door and he's like, well, what's the, what's the problem? You're taking up the whole street with your cars every Tuesday. And he was, he was a little tipsy, and, and, but he was angry about what was going on at our house. Some people get angry about the grace of God. And uh, what this guy should have thought through is, I had mostly young adult black guys in my house, and one of the guys said, Pastor, you want us to take him outside? We'll get him. <laughs> I said, no, we're not going to, that's okay. We don't have to do that. What makes you angry? Listen, some of you in this room, you're angry, and you need to deal with it. You really do. You're just grouchy. You're upset, and it turns to anger, and you do things that you should not do. I used to have an anger problem. Gina Stoddard will tell you that. About once a year, I would completely explode. It was unsettled issues in my life and then other things I was always nipping at little bitty things that did not matter and it was a $189 sale bill that broke my back <laughs> and I mean I got angry and I'll never forget the next Sunday I had to go preach and I knew God had told me you're going to tell the church that you got an anger problem you're going to do it today and you're going to get beyond it can I ask you, do you have an anger problem when God shows grace? It displeased Jonah. How did, you know, we, we think, how in the world could that happen? In chapter 1, he's a runner. In chapter 2, he's a repenter. In chapter 3, he's a revivalist. In chapter 4, he reverts back to his true self. Last year, some of you were on fire for God right after life action, but... but as always, we kind of revert. We all go back, don't we? You can think back in other revival meetings you've been in where God did a great work and so-and-so came to know the Lord. And the next thing you said was, I can't believe that person got saved. Well, yeah. He got saved. She got saved. And that person has the same rights in that saving moment that you and I do in the church. You don't have to come and pay a price for 10 years. You've been saved, you're acquitted, and you're free from your sins. God pardoned you in that moment. He got angry. Some of you, you're angry. You're just an angry person. And that's why you're just mad. And you need to deal with it. Don't be mad because of the grace of God. That's not worth it. And Jonah probably could have said, well, if you knew the Ninevites, I'm a Hebrew, and, and you don't understand the Ninevites. That God doesn't care about that. He loves the Ninevites. Some of you, you're angry at Muslims. You're angry at your neighbors. You're angry, and you need to deal with it. And that's what God does in verse 4. He asked Jonah, he says, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? It's a penetrating question. Should you be angry? Is it good for you to be angry? Are you spiritually effective because of your anger? Are you? When you go to work and you're just an angry grouch, and you zip that email to your coworker in anger, not thinking it through, or you go to school and you're mad at your teacher, and so you decide, I'm going to disrespect her. That's not right. Are you right to be angry? Should we continue to have anger based on things that have happened where God shows grace? You see, look at grace. When we get angry, we're not just angry at where God shows grace. We're actually angry with God's character itself. Jonah said, I knew it. I knew you were going to show mercy, God. I knew you were going to go light on them. I knew you were going to take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake. I just knew it. And I'm mad at you, God. What kind of witness is that? Right? God, how, what is God? God is gracious, it says. He's a gracious God. He's merciful. He, no, he doesn't do me like he could. 
He's slow to anger. The Bible says that God's desire is that none should perish, that all would come to know Christ as personal Savior and Lord. I'm paraphrasing a little, but that's what the verse means in 1 Peter 3, 9, I think it is. Uh, he, he is abounding in steadfast love. The word abound there, it means that when my sin outruns for a moment, God's love goes a little further. When, when this wickedness in my own heart seems to get out of control, God's love abounds way further than any sin or wickedness, uh, whether it's Nineveh or Alan Stoddard. His, his very character is good. You are a relenting God. And I knew you were going to forgive those guys. And that's why I didn't want to go. I've been on visitation like that. You go up to someone's house, you knock on the door, and you want to share the gospel with them, but uh, only because you know you ought to, but you really don't want to see the folks get saved. You really don't want to see what will happen. And that's what happens next. Look at verse 5. Jonah went out to the city, and he, he sat. Uh, to the east of the city and he made a booth for himself there he sat under it in the shade until he could see what would become of the city here's Jonah Jonah's preached the message 40 days and y'all are going to be judged and then he goes out of the city he sets up his little hut and he's looking maybe maybe the repentance won't be enough maybe Maybe, the, maybe they're not sincere and God knows their hearts and maybe the fire is going to fall and I get to see the judgment. You remember when the disciples did that? When they, the people weren't listening and uh, they came and said, hey Lord, they're not listening to the preaching. Would you like us to call down fire on them? You remember that? Uh, some of us, we had the gift of calling down fire when we ought to have the gift of showing love. So Jonah's out here looking like, maybe, maybe, I'm gonna, maybe my way, will, I don't know. He's out there looking, hoping for the worst. It's not right to hope for the worst, by the way. We shouldn't hope for people to not succeed. That's a sin against God. And then he says, it says this, Now the Lord God appointed, key word, God appointed, he's orchestrating things here, a plant, and made it come up, over Jonah. First it was a fish he appointed to go and take care of Jonah. Now it's a plant. Now what's God doing with the plant? Our prophet's sitting over here watching the city. He's got him a little hut, but God appoints a plant and, and he made it come over Jonah that it might be shade over his head. Now you could, sit, you could normally say, so what? Not a big deal. It's all good. But if you've ever been in Saudi Arabia or Iraq, I'm going to tell you, man, that heat it's worse than New Mexico heat. Well, not up here, but down the hill. Uh, I won't say what I'm thinking. Yes, I will. Because if for some reason, I was going to say, if for some reason you don't live up top on the hill, you need to move up here because you need to get out of the heat. So... It saves him from discomfort. So Jonah, he was exceedingly glad. He's exceedingly mad in one verse. He's exceedingly glad in another verse because God is showing him grace. He's got this shade over him, and it's a wonderful thing. God's taking him to the school. The school of God. The school of grace. So... Here's what happens, verse 7. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. God's appointing thing. He's orchestrating these for a reason. That attacked the plant so, it, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah again, do you do well to be angry? Angry enough to die, he says. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do. To be angry, angry enough to die. The word anger is used six times in this chapter. A word that's used six times is a main thrust in a passage. And the word anger here in Hebrew means it's kindled up anger. It's not just I'm a little mad. It's not righteous anger. It means it's boiling in me to where it dictates 
my agenda. It's, my, it's taken over my attitude. And then God ends with this. And the Lord said, you pity the plant. And then in verse 11, he says, should I not pity Nineveh? Can I give you the big idea? We are probably never more unlike God than we care more about a plant than we do people. Let me ask you, I've been wondering this week, where is my application here? Where do I love my comfort more than I love the people who are not yet with God? Christianity that's comfortable at some point is a weak Christianity. Where do you love plants? I'm not, please, uh, you know, I'm not, I love plants, okay? These are great. The analogy is not the plant. The analogy is the thing that brought you comfort. Here's what God did. God showed Jonah mercy and grace, and then he took it from him to say to him, how is it that you like a plant more than you like people? Can I ask you a question? Are you more involved with things in your life and in your church life that relate to comfort than they do people? If that's true, and you're angry, and you're always kind of kicking trouble, I have a great advice for you. Go win 10 people to Jesus Christ and bring them here. Until then, shh. We all need to just shh. We all need to be quiet. And I thought, where am I comfort? I have a comfort zone. And God sometimes wants to kick me out of it. He wants me to not have this idea that grace is shown to where I want grace shown. We're, we may never be more unlike God than when we care more about our own comforts than we do the people of Ruidoso. We may never be more unlike God than when we say, it's all about the color of the carpet. Or you can't paint that. That's been here for 20 years. Or you can't move that. Or you can't get rid of that program, Alan. Don't do that. Or you go to a committee and you say, we can't do that. That would upset our fellowship. I can't go serve downstairs with the kids. I've got to go to my Bible study. How selfish is that of me? Or I can't do this or that. I can't get out of my comfort zone at school and start a Bible study. I can't do that. That would move my cheese. I mean, what would I do? My cheese wouldn't be in the same place. You never met that person. If you move the cheese in the fridge, they like freak out. <laughs> Who moved the cheese? You know? <laughs> and I, listen, I'm like that. I'm not just preaching at you all. I'm like, sometimes I'm really like, Who moved that? It goes over here. <laughs> you know? You know? Listen, we need to be, the, this, this chapter ends with questions. And what a weird, my wife asked me this question this week. She said, she said in chapter 3, why did they put the sackcloth on the animals and what did that look like? I thought, what, first of all, I thought, what a great question. She asked a question after Sunday and I thought, thank you, God. That girl, you, she's listening and thinking, and thinking it through. Because you notice, I didn't address it. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I thought, what was that all about? Well, I, I, I thought of a deep theological truth, and I thought, God loves animals. <laughs> Y'all should amen that. Y'all know we're a dog country. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that means, and then it ends with much cattle. I don't know what that, you know, Scholars for a long time have thought, what a weird ending to the book of Jonah. But it ends with questions, not answers. And that's how we should leave here today. 
you should not leave here with all the answers. You should be leaving asking yourself, do I care more about things that are not important? They're nitpicky, and I could show grace on them. But you don't. It's because you're not a graceful person at that point. Neither am I. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you don't have to believe it. You take this home and do what you want with it. But we, if we're like Jonah, what will happen is we'll go to school, we'll go to work, we'll go in the community, and we'll say, that guy, he doesn't deserve the grace of God. He's a low-down, dirty, rotten scoundrel. He drinks all the time. He's a money miser. He cheats on his wife, blah, blah, blah. Hello? That's where the grace of God is most needed. I mean, if we told the truth, we could go around every person in this room that knows Jesus. And we could stand up and we could set a microphone up and you would tell your story and you would say, yes, I was there. I understand. Yes, that was me. I was the one in need of grace, not someone else. It was me. Why is this important for us as a church? Because I think if we don't learn the principle of the plant and people, we're going to be faking it in some areas. And I'm not sure God entrusts entrust fake people with his grace. Right? I mean, come on. How long? You got an anger problem. How long are you going to let that anger problem boil up in you? That's not what God wants for you. He wants me and you to say, you know, plants are one thing, but people are another. There was a situation in the church where there was a, a lady in the church where uh I mean, she just was a thorn in the pastor's side. It didn't matter what the pastor did. And the pastor was going to address it. But then the Lord spoke to the pastor and said, you're not going to do that. You're going to love that person and leave the results to me. And that pastor did that. And it worked out for the better. You should do that in your job. That person you're mad at, you're always nipping at that person. You should show them mercy, man. You're not messing the other person up. You're messing yourself up. You should take your foot off the gas, hit the brakes, and say, wait a minute. I can't just go like this anymore. Last year, there was a sweet lady in our church during life action. It was great. She came up to me after one of the services, and she said, Pastor, I just want you to know I haven't liked you, and I don't even know why, but I want you to know that I'm sorry and that I love you. And I love that lady now. I mean, I loved her before, but I really love her now because I see the tenderness of her soul, and I see her as a person, not as a church member. We've got to be very careful because God is important involved with people and when you go hurting people you're hurting you're hurting the very thing that God values and we actually start working against God whether it's in a church or it's at the school for the young folks or it's at the college or it's at the workplace God himself we begin working against him when we have a lack of grace in our lives. Where are you with this? You need to get it right? You ask God. Don't let me talk you into anything. You ask God. And say, God, where am I? And you let God deal with you. Because when you finally let God deal with you, you will be changed. Your attitude will change. You will value not structure, not programs, but you will value people. And that's the one thing we can all agree on. And I believe when we do that, that the Lord is going to bless our church abundantly. On May 5th, I believe it is, first Sunday in May, we're going to go back to two services. And uh, my prayer is that God will grow our church in such a way that next October, if we, in and when and if we need to go back to two, it will be impossible. Because we will have reached so many people between now and then, that it will be a moot point. That's what God wants. Amen. That's what God wants for our church. If you get sidetracked, 
on little things that don't matter, you are not helping. You are hurting. Now, if they matter, that's a different deal. And sometimes you got to deal with that. No problem there. Um, at the end of the movie Schindler's List, that movie is amazing. Young folks, if you have not seen Schindler's List, you need to see Schindler's List. It's a movie about the Holocaust and how Jews were being uh, exterminated during the World War II era. They would basically kill them, put them in ovens, and basically burn people to death. But it's a great, it's an incredible movie of redemption. At the end of the movie, uh, the gentleman who's been getting out, uh, uh, his name is uh, leaving me right now, uh, uh, Oscar Schindler, sorry. Um, it's amazing at the end, if you know the scene, he starts taking his rings off. He's about to try to get out of uh, town and the uh, war's coming to an end and he doesn't want to be killed at the end. It's just time for him to go. And he starts taking off his jewelry. His, his, and he starts saying to the people who came, they made him a ring out of gold, out of their teeth. And he begins to take his own resources and say, with this patch, I could have gotten two more people out. With this ring, I could have gotten this. He basically starts going with the resources I had, all the things I was still doing. He says, I could have still gotten more people out. And it's a moving scene. And it makes me think, I come under conviction with this because I think there's so much more I could do for God if I would just do it. There's so much more he wants to do. And we don't want to be standing in the end going, there was more I could do. God, I've wasted time messing with the plant and not showing grace to Ninevites when I should have been pitying those people and reflecting your very character. God, help us to not be the people that when we look back, we go, oh, I could have done more. And we can always say that, I know, but there's a difference be between having an attitude of trying and not doing anything. Can I ask you this? I mentioned the gospel. Have you ever been saved? Have you been converted? Has your heart been changed? Your very, the core of your soul. Have you been converted to where your life is different? If not, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior. Right now in this room, some of you, you have an anger problem and you need to deal with it. You need to deal with it. Now, if God's telling you to deal with it, why don't you deal with it right there in your seat as we pray? Why don't you say, God, you're right. I get angry about things that don't matter. I get mad. And I, I don't want to be that way anymore. If that's you, you can make that decision right there where you're seated. And listen, if you really make it and God does spiritual surgery, you'll leave that anger right there. Jesus died to get rid of that anger in your life. And I can testify, it's nice not being angry. It really is better. And Mrs. Stoddard here would say, Amen. <laughs> so, if that's you, where are you with this message? What a, what a tough chapter. It would have been great if Jonah would have said, if it would have ended with, all right, he obeyed God and revival came. That's not how it ends. It ends with, he reverted back to his same old self. And it, God confronted him with grace. Father, this is a moment where we say thank you for your grace Thank you for this chapter. Thank you, God, for confronting us. God, I know that there are plants in my life where I care more about the physical things at my house. There are things and they need to be done, but God, I don't always put people first. And I just want to say, forgive me. And I want to ask for our church that you would forgive us where we care more about our building, where we care more about our programs. We care more about things that they're important. But we spend more time being critical than we do bringing solutions and helping you. Lord, for these young people, I pray you will help them to see with eyes of mercy and grace as they see their friends and, and other kids at school that do not know you and that they're being indoctrinated by our culture to care more about plants than they do people. Lord, 
for that person who has an anger problem, I pray you'll do business right now. And Lord, for those in this room that if the rapture came and you, t- you took us out of this room in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, some of us would be ready and some of us would not. And for the ones that are not, we pray you will get them ready right here, right now, as they turn their hearts and lives toward you with repentance and faith in the fact that Christ died on the cross. I'm going to give you a moment, my friends, to just pray and listen to this music and do business with God. This is your moment with God this morning. Would you take it?